Bible, the 15th chapter this morning. Matthew chapter 15. As we continue our study through the word of God. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse one, if you would follow along with me. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. At this point in Matthew's gospel, the popularity of Jesus's ministry had grown significantly. Jesus was now recognized everywhere that he went. The multitudes surrounded him. There was an enormous entourage that followed him. Yet with the increasing acceptance among the people, there was also increased speculation and opposition by the religious establishment. Testimonies of the miracles of Jesus had reached the ears of the religious leaders at the headquarters in Jerusalem. They had heard about this feeding of the 5,000 with just a few loaves and fish. They heard about the synagogue ruler's daughter being raised from the dead and so many other miracles as well. Jesus' ministry was powerful. It was effective. It was fruitful. And at this moment, a faction of Pharisees and teachers of the law came to confront Jesus. And one of the things that we will discover concerning the Pharisees is that they had developed a religion of hypocrisy. And they arrived at this place over time. They had developed man-made traditions that they sought to coincide, put alongside of God's written word. They had developed written oral laws in what was called the Mishnah. And these oral laws were a way of spiritual life for them and traditions they'd established. In fact, they said, quote, tradition was the fence around the law. Yet as the years went by and more traditions were established, the fence turned into a prison and the traditional requirements became extreme and unbearable to the people. One example of this was in their unrealistic Sabbath day laws. You were not allowed to carry any burden on the Sabbath because it was considered work. But the strenuous traditions they placed on the Sabbath day and what it meant to truly rest according to what they had written made it almost impossible to rest on the day of rest. You had to work to rest in order to really rest. It just did not make sense, the things they came up with. And one of the most important areas that had been addressed, traditionally speaking, was in the area of cleanliness. They had written 186 pages in the Mishnah, which were devoted to what made you clean. And this tradition originated from the scriptures there in Exodus chapter 30, verse 19, Exodus chapter 40, verse 12. And when it was first written, it had to do primarily with the priests and their cleanliness. But the pious Jews began to practice the priestly washing about 200 years before Christ. So by the time Jesus came there into the region of Galilee, this tradition concerning cleanliness had been firmly embedded into the culture to the point that it was taught as a requirement for all of those who wanted to be clean in the sight of God. So consequently, they were washing all the time. The washing itself, as they refer to here, concerning the washing of hands. Why do your disciples not keep the tradition and not wash their hands before they eat bread? Were they hygienically challenged or is there something else that is referred to here? It was something else. The washing they were referring to consisted of taking one and a half eggshells of water and pouring it over your hands as they were pressed tightly together, upright. And then you would take another eggshell and a half of water with your hands pressed together downward, letting the water drip to your wrist and no further. Then you would flip your hands over and point them downward and, and you would pour over them this way, that way. And finally, you would rub your hands together in your fists with your palms. And this was to be done before every meal and before every 
course. <laughs> Something. They got even more carried away and they devoted 35 pages to how to wash the vessels that were being used. This outer washing had taken on a deeper meaning to the religious leaders. To them, the outer washing had been trivialized so that in their minds, if you were truly clean, if you were really walking in purity before God and you did not do this, you were unclean before God. If you didn't wash your hands in this prescribed manner, you're living an impure life. Legalism was entrenched deeply into their lives. And it became such a problem that a story was told of a rabbi who did not wash ceremonially in this way and he was excommunicated. They took it seriously. The result is these men were far more concerned, listen to me, with what was taking place on the outside than what was going on on the inside. They went through the motions outwardly, but inwardly they were full of hypocrisy as Jesus will point out. Jesus is asked, how come your disciples are transgressing? You know what Jesus did? Jesus asked them a question. They asked him a question. He gave them an answer by asking them a question. He did this often. Verse two, he said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition? They said of the keeping of the elders. Jesus said, well, why do you, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it's a gift from God, then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. The Pharisees said, why did the disciples transgress the traditions? And Jesus said, why do you transgress the law of God by your tradition? It's a good question. The religious leaders had developed a loophole, a way around keeping the law of God by embedding a tradition in its place. The word of God said you're to honor your father and mother, which meant you also take care of them when they get older. You help them, you assist them later in life. But the tradition that had been established stated that if you had something in your house that was of great value, you could say it was korban, meaning it was dedicated to God. You could still keep it in your house. You could use it for your purposes, but it was dedicated to God. So if, for example, the parents of a Pharisee came and said, son, we need your help. We're hurting. Can you help us? He could say, oh, oh, mom, dad, I would would love to help you. Um, But you know, uh, I, this is all Corban. It's all dedicated to God. I'd I love to help you, but it's Corban. I, I just can't. And this allowed them to get out of an obligation because they said it's all been dedicated to God. It was an easy way for these men to get out of meeting the needs of others and hindered them from honoring their father and mother in time of need. The bottom line is the Pharisees used their tradition to violate God's word. Why should anybody obey a code of traditions that would cause you to violate or go against God's word? You shouldn't. They'd established their own form of righteousness that they were proud of, and they made it their business to make disciples of their hypocrisy. They took parts of God's word that they liked, and other parts of God's word, they found a way around it. Do you know people like that? Here Jesus said the result of living that way in verse six, you have made the commandment of God of no effect because of your tradition. God's word has no impact on your life because you take what you want and dismiss what you don't like. In other words, Jesus is saying, what's the use of seeking to keep the commandment and listen, putting it on your forehead? You know, they wear these things on their foreheads. The phylacteries, there's like these little boxes that they tie around their head. Do you know what's inside that? The law, passage of scripture. They tie it around their wrist. They have a thing on the door that they touch when they come in. It represents what they believe. They touch it. They pray it. They've got it wrapped around. You can have all of those things, but all that is is just an outward piece of leather on your forehead that has no impact on your life. 
You disregard it. In reality, the Pharisees had a form of godliness, but they really denied the power. There are some today who, like these religious leaders, are self-deceived into thinking that if you clean up the outside because you go through a tradition, maybe handed down through the years, or maybe you go to church like you've always done, that that's enough. The fact is God is far more concerned about what's going on on the inside of my life than he is on the outside because what, what comes on the outside starts within. You can, you can clean up. You can check the box. You can go through the motions. I have a, my life is pretty much put together. But what about the inside? Do you find passages of scripture that you disregard because you don't like it? I, don't, I think that's open to interpretation. I, I don't think that really means what, what it says it means. Really? I'm pretty, it does say what it says it means. And, and God's not confused by this. But some people do that. They, they even, even in churches, dismissing passages of scripture as that's not for today. I would hate to stand before the living God and say, I, don't, I didn't think you meant what you said when you wrote that. Here's what Jesus' response was to the Pharisees in verse seven. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. It's very sobering what he says. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people, he said to them, they draw near to me with their lips, with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me and they teach his doctrine, the commandments of men. Look at what happens when you Get away from God's word and implement your own standard of righteousness. Do you know what happens? First of all, Jesus said it's hypocritical. The word comes from two words meaning play actor, a man of many faces, hypocrite, hypocritas. In ancient culture, when you played a part, you put a mask up. This is the mask for this. And if you're playing a different part, it's this mask or it's that mask, depending on where you are. You put the mask on. It's hypocritical. They pretend, this is my work face. This is my church face. This is hanging out with my friend's face. Hey. You know, what, what face are you wearing? Who are you pretending to be? Jesus then looked back at a prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And Isaiah was prophesying to the people saying that they were drawing near with their mouth and their lips. They were saying the right thing, but their heart was far from me. And how this was revealed is they would come to the tabernacle or the temple and they would worship God, offer their sacrifices. They would leave the temple and they would go to the altars of idols and worship there right after. They just went to church and then they left church and went and worshiped idols. They were saying all the right things. Their hands were lifted the words coming out of their mouth saying he is holy forever and then they leave as if nothing ever happened. They went right back to the altar of idolatry and began to worship there. And, and here it says, in vain you do this. In vain you're worshiping. You're just going through the motions. That's what the Pharisees were doing. Furthermore, he said they were teaching as doctrine. They were holding their tradition to the same level as God's word. Teaching as doctrine the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God. Are you going through the motions today? Hmm. Do you worship God on Sunday only to deny him Monday through Saturday? I remember as a young man, a young boy really, singing an old song that used to, we learned, and it was a simple song. Maybe you remember it. Ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all day Sunday, ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? It's every day of the week. It's 365, 366 if you count leap year. Every day you're a Christian, man. Not just Sundays. They were playing the hypocrite. You know, the world always plays the there's so many hypocrites in the church card when they want to justify what they're doing. Would to God that it wasn't that way. 
that there was no evidence for that. When people say that to me, I always say, well, why don't you come and join? You, you, you fit right in. <laughs> I say that in love, but it's the truth. We've all played the hypocrite at some point. Jesus then gives an explanation to the multitudes that are gathered around who had been taught these traditions of men as doctrine. When he had called the multitude, he said to them, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man. It's what comes out of his mouth that defiles the man. That, that's what really defiles him. It's not, I didn't wash my hands traditionally and I ate something and oh my goodness, I'm, I'm impure. That, that's not where impurity comes from. It starts inside and makes its way outside. Furthermore, the disciples then, notice this, they're, now they're a little bit concerned because these guys are from Jerusalem. These aren't the, you know, the, the lowly Pharisees from some, you know. These, these guys are from the headquarters. You look at their concern, verse 12. Then his disciples came to him and said, um, do you know, this is saying this to Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? I don't, I'm not sure if you picked up on, on that, Jesus. Can you imagine that? Hey, Lord, tone it down. These guys are getting serious. This could look really bad for, for you, of course. I mean, these people, they're from Jerusalem. You offended them. Really? What? Why did you offend them? Because sometimes the truth offends. What, what did Jesus say that wasn't true? All he did was present the truth and they were offended by it. And he said to his disciples, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted, it's going to be uprooted. Let them alone. And then he described them. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Well, that's pretty clear. Jesus said, there, don't worry about it. Blind leading the blind. It's asking a blind man for directions and he's leading you, but he can't see. You must be blind also. That's what they were. They were blind leaders of the blind. They were leading people astray. And Jesus was bringing the truth that could set them free. But Jesus didn't leave his disciples there. He gave them a real explanation. What really makes someone unclean? I mean, I mean, really. Peter answered and said to him, Lord, explain this parable to us. Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do, do you not yet understand Whatever enters the mouth, here he's explaining it very, very patiently. Whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach, it's eliminated. But the things which proceed out of the mouth, they come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But, but to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. He makes the distinction. It's not about the traditional washing that makes you unclean. This is where the uncleanness comes from. It comes from in the heart. All of these things that come out of the heart are, are an indication of what's going on inside. If a man is jealous, envious, covetous, where does that start? He didn't, you know what? He didn't wash his hands. I'll tell you, that's what happened. You been washing your hands? Because I see there's something going on there. I think you, uh, I can tell you, you got a little attitude. Did you wash your hands ceremonially? You didn't, did you? I knew it, I knew it. Why don't you go and wash your hands, come back out, we'll have a conversation. No, it has nothing to do with it. It starts inside. It starts inside. If a person is prideful, where does that begin? Inside the heart of that person? And then it's worked out in their actions? If a person is profane in their speech, and their language that they use, where does, where does that happen? It starts in the heart. It's, it's, you're getting a revelation of, wow, got some heart issues there because I can hear it. It's coming out. It makes its way to the surface. And, and if you've been a Christian for some time, you know that life will present and the Lord will allow certain circumstances at times to reveal what is in our heart that we didn't, necessarily know was there. Never found, probably, probably not this, this service, but, but other, you know, you, it happens. It happens. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, it says, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. For what purpose? To humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart. 
whether or not you would obey the commands of the Lord. It wasn't like the Lord didn't know what was in the heart of the nation of Israel. He knew exactly what was going on inside of their hearts. It was for them to see what was going on. So God allowed them to be tested. God allowed them to go through the wilderness so that they could see there's a change that needs to take place. This is coming out of my heart. I wish I could say to you that this never happens to me, that God reveals things about my heart that I don't necessarily like to see. but I'm sure I'm among friends in this regard. I will confess to you. It happened today on the way to church. I was on my way, got in a little bit late last night from Tennessee. We were out doing a men's conference and flew in and on my way to church this morning, I thought, man, I need a cup of coffee. And so I drove by a local coffee shop here, which will remain anonymous. (laughs) It's right down the street. It's got like a, like a mermaid on it. Anyways, I was driving through green. Anyway, I'm driving through. And I, I go inside and I got, I got some people in there because I usually see them. And so I've got relationships. I know them on a first name basis. And I see my guy in there, my barista. <laughs> my barista man. He's got a mask on. All of them had masks on. I said, hey, what's up with the masks? Why do you guys got masks on? I said, well, somebody got COVID, so we have to wear them till this particular date. And I didn't, without even thinking, I just, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. I was like. I said, stoop. There's other things I could have said, but that came out. And I I just was like, and after I walked out, the Holy Spirit was like, hey, 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 hey. I mean, it's true, but you know, <laughs> some things need to remain inside maybe, but it's dumb. It makes no sense. Like you just better get used to wearing that because you're going to have lots of people coming in here sick, wanting coffee. Uh, it bothered me. I came in all just, I, I had to pray. I was like, I got to get in the spirit, man. We got church. <laughs> It happens. God showed me what was in my heart. Somebody asked me, did you still buy coffee? I'm like, yeah, this is my guy. It's not his fault. Anyway, what's coming out your heart? What are you saying? Oh, these guys, man, they drew near with their lips. They worship, they raise their hands. God is good. Then they ran to the altars and it really Jesus said, as long as that was taking place, worship was vain. You just have become really good at doing certain things because people do them around you. But if you're running to the altars of idols right after, there's, there's something that needs to change within the heart. And until that change, you're just, you're just going through the motions, man. You're, you're playing a part. Don't play a part. Let it be real. Let it be authentic. That's what God desires. He desires truth, the Bible says, in the inward parts. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, the Bible says. Search me, oh God, try me. See if there's something in here. Show me my heart. It's painful. But he reveals it so that he can remove it. I can repent of it. Well, following this confrontation with the Pharisees, it says in verse 21, then, after that, Jesus went out from there and he departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus leaves the area of Galilee now. He makes his way to a Gentile region that is in southern Lebanon on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And while he was in this region, Jesus encountered a woman who was in great need of his help. And we read in verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan, came from that region and cried out to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Mark's gospel also records this encounter and tells us that she came and she fell at the feet of Jesus and she was crying out. And the word that is used there for crying out implies continually crying out, would not stop until he responded, frantically crying out. 
Now, this woman had a few things against her. First of all, her race, she was a Canaanite, came from the area of Canaan. The Old Testament, the Canaanites were to be driven out of the land. They were practicing all kinds of vile idolatry. Her religion, she was Seraphonician, which seems to imply that she was obviously of Greek persuasion, religiously, which meant probably a worshiper of all kinds of different idols. She resided in a culture that was well known for its depraved pursuits. Also her gender. That is, she was a female. And in that culture during that day, unfortunately, women were not elevated to the proper position of equality. And so oftentimes they were disrespected, not treated properly. The gospel is really what elevated God's heart for women. But she had something going for her, and that is she came to Jesus. The demon possession of her daughter had drove her to the feet of Jesus. How did her daughter get demon possessed? We don't know. Was it because of her involvement with with this idol worship? Is that what introduced her daughter to to the the realm of of this spiritual realm that caused her to be demon possessed? We don't know. But we do know from other passages in scripture what happened to a person who was demon possessed. A demonic spirit taking up residency in their body and and the horrible effects that would happen. The man whose son was demon-possessed, he would throw him in the water, throw him in the fire. The, The man of Gadara, he would cut himself in the middle of the night, violently hurting himself and chained and living in a gravesite. I mean, this mother was desperate for the sake of her daughter. This great affliction brought her to the feet of Jesus. That's what brought her to Jesus. What was it? Her, her, her trial, her affliction. The Bible says in Psalm 119, it is good for me that I've been afflicted that I may learn your statutes. Sometimes God will allow some trial, some affliction to get someone's attention who wouldn't normally even think about God. He's not in any of their thoughts and yet some affliction comes and suddenly they realize, I need help. And all of my resources are tapped and nobody can assist me. I need prayer even. If there's a God up there, I need help. Affliction that drives people sometimes to their awareness, to their need for God. And this woman, she pleads with Jesus for mercy. She didn't come to Jesus with the attitude of he owed her anything or that she was worthy to ask for something that she she didn't deserve. She's just pleading for mercy. You know, the Bible tells us that our God is a merciful God. I'm so thankful that he is. The Bible says in Exodus, the Lord descended in a cloud and he stood with Moses and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the God that we serve. He is merciful. And if you need mercy, his mercies are new every morning. One of the things that we'll discover in this meeting with this woman is that Jesus helps this woman's faith to grow. He draws it out to the point that when the conversation is ended, he will refer to her faith as great faith. It didn't start out that way. She comes to Jesus and she calls him the son of David. Now keep this in mind. She's outside of the covenant relationship. She's not a Jew. Maybe she's thinking, maybe I should just call him the son of David, the Messiah. Hey, son of David. Maybe she heard that from somebody else. Maybe that's the thing that will get me the upper hand that he'll actually answer if I I call him by a messianic title. To me, as I see this, she's kind of just, she's saying the right things. But there's more that God wanted to do in her life. Oh, son of David, help me, help me. And what's fascinating to me, as she employs this messianic title, being a Gentile, Jesus doesn't even answer her. It says here that, He did not respond. She's begging for mercy. She's telling him about the situation. Verse 23, he answered her not a word. Silence, no response. That's difficult. You ever prayed and got no response? I mean, there's not an immediate answer. And you think the heavens are silent? Like, wait a second, you hear me, right? Because it doesn't seem like you hear me. He's not answering. I'm praying, I'm I'm pleading, I'm asking, and there's no response. Why did Jesus not answer this woman? Why did he remain silent initially? Was Jesus simply tired, too tired to minister to her? 
It seems very uncharacteristic of what we know of him up to this point. He's helped other people. Jesus did not say no, he would not heal her, nor did he say yes, he would heal her right away. He said nothing. Sometimes I think this is one of the hardest answers to receive. No answer at all, except wait. Who likes to wait? Not many people that I know. But even in the waiting, there is a purpose. There are moments when it appears that the Lord is silent, but we shouldn't assume that he is wanting to destroy our faith, but rather he is developing our faith. This was not the silence of indifference, but of love. Weeding through the motives, I believe. Jesus is seeking to draw this woman's faith out, testing the motives. Why, why are you here? Why are you here? I mean, really, why are you here? Call me the son of David. Why, why are you here? The Bible says it's the earnest, fervent, faithful prayer of a righteous person that avails much. Great faith doesn't quit or give up that easily. It's persistent and it perseveres. Now, the disciples assumed the fact that Jesus didn't respond. Maybe he wasn't concerned. And so they gave one of their suggestions that they often gave um, to the response to the need. Notice the disciples, they urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. You ever notice how many times the disciples like, just can you send them away? There's all these opportunities for ministry. Like, can we boot them? I mean, 5,000 people, 5,000 people. Can you just send them away? Do you realize what they would have missed out on if, they, if Jesus had listened? One of the greatest miracles. But they said, send them away. But when they brought, how about this? They brought the children to be dedicated by Jesus. And the disciples were like, hey, let's get the kids out of here. And, they, and Jesus rebuked them. He rebuked them. Sorry, Lord, that was Peter's idea. We, we don't, we didn't, we weren't thinking. We, we love kids. We love kids. It doesn't say that. I'm just suggesting it, perhaps. But sometimes you realize how insensitive we really are. We're not aware about the needs of others. We miss maybe what the Lord wants to do because it's just send them away. It's just easier. Just, 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 just send them away. We, won't, we don't have to deal with it. Listen, the Bible tells us that when those who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves, Romans tells us. Well, Jesus then engages. He answered in verse 24 and he says to her, well, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She calls him son of David and he says, I was, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That, that was Jesus' initial ministry. He came as the Messiah for the Jewish people. The Bible says in John, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God. He came to the Jews first. They rejected him, many of them. And that opened the door for the Gentiles to be saved. And so he tells this woman who's a Gentile, listen, I'm, I'm, this is the focus of my ministry. I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But notice verse 25. Now, now it goes to a, a different level. Then she came, worshiped him, and just said, Lord, help me. Enough with the titles. Enough with the, you know, I'm not, I'm not there's no games here. This is real. Help me. I mean, what a, what a cry of a desperate mother who doesn't know what to do with her child. God, help me. Maybe there's some parents here today. That's your prayer. Lord, help me. I don't know how to help them. I don't know what to do. I've run out of options. I've run out of, you know, parental. I, I don't know what to do. Help me, God. She worshiped him. The, the, the word that's used here literally means to prostrate oneself and it is frequently used in the, in the act of worship. It's humility and complete submission before God. There is desperation in her pleading. She just falls out and just says, please help me. The faith of this woman is continuing to rise to the surface. She's persistent in her prayers and she's worshiping. She's just calling him, Lord, Lord, help me. Now, the response of Jesus may be shocking at first reading, and I'll explain. Look at Jesus' response to this pleading woman. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Ouch, I mean, that is, this is a pleading mother. I know you're sent to the lost sheep, the children of Israel, but like, hey, sorry, I can't, I can't throw the bread to the, to the little dogs. That sounds so so sad for them to say that. So insensitive. How could Jesus call this woman a little dog? Is that what he's implying? There are two words that are used for dog in scripture. One 
is a ravenous, disease-infested, foaming-at-the-mouth kind of dog that is dangerous and you need to be protected from. That is not the word that he uses here. He actually uses little dogs, which refers to a little puppy. A little puppy. She says, yes, Lord. Look at her response. Yet even the little dogs, those little puppies, eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She said, Lord, you're right. You're absolutely right. She agrees with him. She said, you're right. It's, it's, he's drawing out her faith. Son of David. She's a Gentile. Let's clarify. I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I've come for the children. But Lord, I, I just, all I'm asking for is a crumb. I'm undeserving. I'm pleading for mercy. I need your help. Jesus is drawing her faith out. And then he says to her, oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is a, often, again, as I said, a misunderstood exchange between Jesus and this woman. She picked up on the illustration in the words of Jesus and just said, even the little puppies eat from the master's table. She wasn't claiming to be worthy. She was humbly persistent in her prayer and Jesus rewarded her faith and said, great is your faith. And the moment he said these words, her daughter was immediately, the demon departed. She was healed instantly. The Bible tells us in Luke's gospel, Jesus was encouraging his disciples as they would pray and seek the Lord. He told them to be consistent, to be persistent, to persevere in prayer. And he talked about a, a man who came to his neighbor's home and at midnight and he was asking for loaves of bread. And he said, can you, I got, I got people coming over and I didn't have time. Can I borrow some bread? And, and the man behind the door said, listen, I'm already asleep. I, it's too late. I can't come to the door. Just come back tomorrow. He said, no, I, I, I need it now. Please help me. And, and the man said, okay, I'll get up. And he gets up. This is Luke chapter 11. He gets up, opens the door, gives him the bread. Why? He gave it to him because of his persistence. Jesus then took that illustration, and this is what he said concerning praying and interceding. He said in Luke chapter 11, I ask you, or so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks find, and to him who knocks it will be opened. What are you praying about? What are you, what are you seeking the Lord for? God does answer. He answers. He doesn't answer always the way I want him to or the way I think he should or when I think he should. But he answers. Some of you, it's wait and you are waiting. How long do I have to wait? I don't know. Others of you, it's no and you got to accept it. Okay, Lord, I accept it. You got something better. For others of you, it's yes. I don't know where you're at in this prayer, but you keep on asking. You keep on seeking. You keep on knocking. You wait to hear the response of the Lord. What's he going to say to you? What's he going to present to you? This woman came and her faith grew. It was desperation that brought her to the feet of Jesus and she pleaded with him and he answered her prayers and he responded to her faith. Finally, we see in verse 29, Jesus departed from there and he skirted the Sea of Galilee and he went up on the mountain and he sat down there and great multitudes came to him having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed and many others. I love this. They laid them down at, the, at Jesus' feet and he healed them. And so the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Suddenly people were coming from every direction, bringing every need they had, all different needs, bringing them to the feet. Oh, I love that. To the feet of Jesus. And when they brought them to the feet of Jesus, he met the need. Do you have anything you need to bring to the feet of Jesus today? Any concerns that you have? Any things that are overwhelming you that you want to bring to the feet of Jesus? I remember many years ago reading in a book about a statue. And please forgive me, I can't recall the, I want to say France, but I, I, I don't know for sure. But a particular statue 
where you would look at the statue and it was a statue of Jesus and the way that the sculptor had placed it, you really couldn't see the face of Jesus. It was kind of turned in such a way, but there was an inscription at the bottom of the statue. And when you got down and you read the inscription, it said, if you want to see his face, you need to sit at his feet. And from that angle, you look and you could see him. Just coming to that place. And it, the illustration is powerful in that I come to the feet of Jesus and I see him in ways that I hadn't seen before. Just humble, broken, desperate. Lord, I need you. I need you. I do believe that this is the place that God wants to bring us as a nation to a place of brokenness and humility before God. It's definitely where he wants to bring us to as a state and as a church, as a people. Whatever you have, whatever's going on, hey, lay it down at the feet of Jesus today. Give it over to him and allow him to meet that need in your life. Great is your faith. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your people today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that you seek to draw our faith out. Sometimes it's, it's difficult. We don't always understand what you're doing, but we trust that you know what you're doing. Father, also for those today, maybe they've just been, like we read today, going through the motions, just, you know, playing a part, putting on a mask. I pray that, that the mask would be thrown away and there would be sincerity and genuineness, Lord, with the relationship with you, not just worshiping in the church and running to the altars of the world, but, but Lord, smashing the altars and idols of this world and, and just worshiping you. Father, thank you for today. Minister to your people. We trust that you will. We continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us this morning?